everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join us today. We've taken the opportunity to host our normal chapter meetings um, with the runway to recovery theme. And today it's the turn of the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal. Hope you like my background. I'm, I'm elephanting um, and I hope that all of you are in beautiful surrounds as well. Before we kick off, as you know, SATSA is an independent membership based private sector association. We are hosting these webinars in lieu of our chapter meetings, but that doesn't mean to say that they are only closed to SATSA members. The panelists that are joining us today are also not here to represent KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape, and I want to be clear on that. Their job is not to represent your voice. Their job is to elicit a discussion and to get you on the chat and the Q&A to share your specific views. This is not about looking at a runway for recovery for the two provinces alone. We're looking at it at national level, but if you are wanting to put forward province-specific suggestions, we would welcome them with open arms. So, uh, if you could please share anything that you would like to in the chat or on the Q&A, there'll be a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and field as many of the questions that come through on that Q&A later. If you put something on the chat, we will definitely incorporate that into our feedback for the submission to the Tourism Business Council. And if you feel that you have additional feedback you'd like to share, you can also email that to communications at satsa.co.za. Communications at satsa.co.za. One final little plea from me before we begin, and that's to keep the discussion constructive. We all seen the suggested timelines. We all feel each other's pain acutely right now. And we'd really like for this to be a session to give you the platform to share your ideas with your industry colleagues constructively so that together we can pull something meaty to map out the way forward. So let's focus on solutions. Don't be shy. Share your ideas in the chat. Ask your questions in the Q&A. And we will also be recording the session. So if you missed a section or you'd like to forward it to a colleague, you'll have that recording in the coming days. So with that uh, out of the way, David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Natalia, and welcome and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is the third of our uh, Runway to Recovery sessions. Um, and really privileged to be joined by a real, real august uh, panel this afternoon, which I'm going to introduce. And then I'll kick off with some, just to sort of sketch the context before we, we jump into um, the substance of the, of the conversation. So. Um, let me start on the left, and it's great that you've got your background there, Natalia, because one of the great bull elephants of uh, the tourism industry is Adrian Gardner. He is with us today, and we're really privileged, Adrian, that you you can be with us. Um, and must say, we your your background looks looks really cool. And as always, we'll we'll be looking forward to um, some insights from you. Then we've got Graham Watson, who is our KwaZulu Natal Satsa chair. Um, also the Key Account Sales Manager, UK, Ireland and USA for Thompson's Africa. So Graham, welcome to you. We have Gavin Eyre, who is the SATSA Youth Chapter Chair um, and also um, CEO or MD at, I'm not sure which Gav, at International House Language School in, in Cape Town. And Gavin does, is, you know, we, we will be drawing on you for a perspective from the sort of youth side of travel, just to give us, give us that sort of inflection. Then we have. Um, uh, Craig Smith, somebody I've known for many years and one of the sharpest minds, and also I might add one of the most generous minds in the industry, somebody who's always been willing to share, who's never been precious about um, any information and, and indeed his customers. So Craig, it's, it's great to have you with us and, and, and we look forward to, to your insights. And then guys, what we try to do in, in um, our sessions is to get an insight from um, our key source markets. Um, to my mind, when we talk about recovery and from an inbound perspective, this is not going to come from Estonia or Brunei or some of the more emerging markets. This is going to come from um, our existing customers, and that's North America and Europe. So we're very privileged uh, to have Andy Hunt with us um, today. Andy is from Holiday Architects in the UK and a long history in, 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 in outbound travel out of, out of the UK market. So Andy, we look, we, we look forward to your, your views going forward. So as Natalia said, this is, these, these sessions are here to stimulate and catalyze a, a inputted um, perspective on inbound travel that we can carry forward 
as a message to government. And the best way to do that is in a structured engagement. And I'm very pleased to um, announce to everybody, we had a very constructive meeting, um, the Tourism Business Council of South Africa, on which I serve, I chair the marketing committee. We met this morning with um, Cees and Shona and, and top, top guys at SAT. And we, we, we've agreed, finally, a, a really useful, useful way forward. So all the input that we gather through this process from your inputs, your emails, your comments, um, are going to be collated and we will be sitting down. I'm just going to do a little screen share here quickly. We're going to be sitting down. Um, there we go. We've got, a, got, a, got an SA Tourism TBCSA steering committee at the top. And then next week, we're going to be having, in terms of breaking the whole tourism sector down, we're going to be having our first inbound working group with, with South African tourism towards the end of next week. Equally, there's going to be a working group on the domestic and outbound side. And separate to that, a very important working group around aviation and access. Um, and there's another, although it doesn't feature on, on this graphic, there's another very important working group that's going to be put into place because we need to move quickly. And that's a working group on protocols and operationalizing the protocols along all aspects of the value chain so that we are able to pre present a compelling argument to government that the sector is willing to open far earlier than was previously thought, and we can do so safely. My final comment, guys, let me let's get out of that, um, is on the president's speech last night. So we heard from we heard from, from President Ramaphosa last night in many ways, and the initial um, response was 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 just, I think, a little, you know, this is a bit underwhelming, there's no detail here. But I think when you read between the lines and you and, and you go back and listen to what the president said, I think it's I think it's a massive win, and I think it's a massive win for the economy, um, and 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 opening up the economy. But it puts a real onus on us to get our message through and to get our lobbying efforts through. And our two previous sessions were 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 incredibly informative. Um, there were good points made, and one of the key ones is let's take the emotion out, guys. What, whatever we put forward has got to be reasoned, measured, and very importantly, data-driven as much as possible. So one of the key outputs of this morning's meeting was that we are going to do a joint SAT-TBCSA survey. It's important that we get a future view of, of the sector. The surveys to, to date were done in the first 30 days when you know, we were a bit dazed, we were a bit shaken, and, but people were still getting paid at the end of March possibly at the end of April. Going forward, we're moving into a very dire phase, and we have got to convey the, the urgency of um, the impact, the economic impact on, on, on our sector to government. And that, that has got to go hand in hand with, with a constructed, constructive and measured view on how we can open up safely as early as possible. So just a couple of opening remarks from, from my side. I'm going to go around the panel and just get your, your sort of opening thoughts, and in that, just tease out for us a couple of the key issues that you think are important, and, 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 and we'll be coming back to those throughout the course of the off, um, afternoon. So, Adrian, let's kick off with you, um, and the floor's yours. Thank you, David, and I think those were very good opening remarks, you know, about how you're trying to get together and uh, with all the other voices in the industry and come, try and come up with something practical. But firstly, I'm, I'm grateful for you that you shared with us the ATEC um, panel that had that discussion in, in Australia. And, you know, the three things came out of that for me is, you know, they, one of the big things that they said was build a brand Australia. So, you know, I know that our funds have been cut and all the rest of it, but surely this is where we've got to build a brand South Africa. So I think that that for me was quite a, a, a big uh, output of theirs. And secondly, what you mentioned in your opening remarks, is that the domestic airline, for a start, if we're gonna have domestic tourism and that's gonna open up, we've got to have some proper communication with the airlines, and as you said, that's what you're busy with, because to say we're opening up into domestic tourism and we don't even know if there's an airline gonna fly and how many airlines are gonna be left, again, I think that that needs further discussion. And then there's gotta be interprovincial access if we're gonna have domestic tourism, as we've all been talking about. And domestic tourism, to a large extent, doesn't fit a lot of our product. You know, we've analyzed it and said to ourselves, look, okay, if we went to the domestic market, what rate could we get? And 
does it pay us to open at that rate? And then I, I basically uh, took uh, um, my vision of this thing. I decided to really look at what, what are our assets here in, in, in South Africa, in Southern Africa. Uh, as we said and I listened yesterday, is that, you know, um, South Africa is a hub of sort of Southern Africa. So regional tourism is exceptionally, in my opinion, important. Then secondly, we've got obviously our climate and our beaches. Uh, and then for um, sort of our business and everything, one of the greatest assets that we've got is wildlife. You know, and what we've, we've seen a hell of a lot of work being done with the communities in the metropolitan areas. And I've got one to talk about it later when you come to me. What are we doing about the communities in the, um, in the, in, in the areas where there's wildlife? Because we've seen horrible videos of the, what's going on there. So we've got, we've got a plan and I'll, I'll gratefully share that with you later. And then obviously our other great asset is, um, you know, our cities, Cape Town and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I just think that, um, you know, it's a far bigger picture than uh, just, um, you know, saying, well, we've got to open, when we're going to open, how we're going to open, what are the consequences? Of, and I want to uh, use this opportunity to really look at the broader side of, of South Africa and its assets. And I really think that we must focus to an extent on our wildlife and uh, what a major asset that that is when people come to visit us. And I'll share some initiatives that not only have we started, but I think that are going to be very important in terms of rural communities. So thank you for that opportunity of just uh, giving a brief introduction. Thank you, Adrian, and thanks, thanks for being with us. Um, so let's, let's swing totally sort of around and um, Gav, Gavin Eyre, why don't you kick off and some introductory remarks from, from, from your constituency? Yeah, well, thank you, David, and uh, very difficult to, to follow such a, uh, a person as Adrian, but anyway, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so youth, youth tourism, youth travel, um, I think everybody knows around the world that uh, youth tourism and youth travel, and I'm talking about the backpacking side of things in the hostels, the language schools, volunteer organizations, and, the, and our tourism transport operators. And it has been known through many, many a, a, a long time that the youth are, are intrepid travelers, they love to travel, um, tsunamis, terrorist attacks, pandemics and things like that, they're always the first to start back. So I think that the, the, the youth side of South Africa, what we have to offer, and certainly up there in the Eastern Cape, you know, I sit, I sit here in, in Cape Town and, um, you know, I'm very lucky to be in such a place. And when we speak to our guests and our language students, we always say, listen, guys, you need to go, you need to, you need to spread your wings, you know, to, you need to get out of Cape Town, you need to go up the garden route, you need to go further, further than PE, up, up into the wild coast. And it's very difficult. And I think the, you know, we have to reinvent ourselves moving forward now um, with what we've got, with what we've got. And as Adrian said, you know, the beaches, the, the wildlife, it's not in Cape Town. And I, and I think that the Eastern Cape has got a, has got a real lot to, uh, to offer. And, and my, we have some fantastic members up there. I saw a very, uh, just, to, just to give you, uh, I read a very interesting article from the, from the Australian, and it gave some really, really good little points that we should be thinking about when we're moving forward. Very quickly, you know, distribution platforms messing with the market, travel agents who don't add value, you know, this is the time to sort all these types of people out. Government ignoring infrastructure requirements for visitors, like some of the bad roads that we have up in the Eastern Cape. Sort that out. Penalty rates and staff rates. Tourism dispersal. Get the people out of the big cities into the areas such as the Eastern Cape where it is free. There is so much space. And these, I feel, are the, are the areas that we can, really, we can really work on. Another one was the Instagram influencers. We should be using professional Instagram users and not the rubbish that's out there at the moment. The customers aren't always right. This is a time now to sort that, those types of things out. Unnecessary overheads. We've all had big, big um, offices. Do we need them anymore? We've proven that we can use them. Um, we can use Office. We can use Zoom. We can work from home. We can get the interaction there. Um, salespeople running the show. You know, not tourism, not real people who know about the tourism product. Things like that are really interesting. Sustainability. I think this is the time now we should be looking at sustainability and working with governments. 
uh, and drive your business forward with customer focused um, in, in innovation. And I think that when we, start, when we start to look at what we've got in the Eastern Cape and in certainly the country, um, our local tourism, and, and I agree slightly a little bit with David there, what he says about, um, but I can tell you now, speaking to my friends who've got three and four kids, the first thing that they want to do, they will take out a bank loan to go up and get in a car and go to somewhere where they don't have to listen to their kids in, a, in another room every single day. So I really think that the domestic market is, is, a, is a good, is a good um, possibility. It won't short, sort out our problems, but it's certainly a, a way forward there as well. And I was chatting this morning to Mandisa, the, the, Cape of the, uh, um, the, Cape, uh, the chair of the, of the Eastern Cape, and she's got some really good ideas in, in, in moving and ideas of how to promote the Eastern Cape with the relevant, the good authorities, Eastern Cape Tourism Board, Mandela, Nelson Mandela Bay, these types of things. So that's just a few ideas from me. Um, but I say the youth, I think, are the ones that can pull us out of a little bit of a mess. Thank you. Great, great perspective there. Thank you, Gav. Um, Graham, let's turn to you um, and uh, give us give us your initial thoughts and. Uh, you know, tease out some issues we can come back and get into some more detail on later on. Yeah, no problem at all. I mean, I've, I've, I've been on the, uh, I'm on the, uh, the uh, tourism recovery task team with um, Tourism KZN and we, and I've been on quite a few webinars with the uh, Durban Tourism as well. You know, just talking about how we can keep uh, Durban in particular and the province you know, it's looking so lovely and clean at the moment and let's keep it that way. So that has been brought to the mayor's attention and um, we're going to be looking at blue flag beaches and all that kind of stuff, you know, because it's very, I mean, if you look at what's what's happening in the center of town, it's, it's so lovely and clean and pristine. And that's always been a problem for a lot of, um, a lot of us working in the tourism ministry in, in Durban. And it's certainly come up in a lot of sets of uh, chapter meetings on, in, in the, the cleanliness of, of the city and the general appearance. We also discussed a public-private partnership along the lines of a, a doctor spot where corporates can adopt a certain section or a beach or a park or something like that in, in the cities and, and around the provinces and, and maintain them for us. Um, and also that we, we discussed a lot of it is um, self-promotion. Now is the time to work on your your online activity, your videoing, your products, you know, taking, taking us in the tourism industry and our partners abroad on a virtual site inspection of your property, you know, once that is allowed. And if you've got anything um, now that, that we can work on and, and get that out. So, a lot, yeah, a lot of it's just, and, and, and looking at projects that have been on the back burner for quite some time. We know, we all know that the Drakensberg Cable car has been spoken of for many, many years. So that's kind of being rejuvenated and the discussions around that. The, um, you know, the airport access, getting more flights in. Um, Durban Tourism and I had a, had a meeting on Monday, I think it was. And, um, you know, there, there is a lot of exciting things. And I think that, um, you know, we can do a lot more of these meetings just with, with, uh, with all that, um, with all those initiatives. You know, a pay now, stay later initiatives as well, uh, not just for properties, but also for restaurants in, in the area where you can buy a voucher now to use in the future to perhaps uh, um, get more value in the, in the future when you can use it. That just helps with the cash flow of the businesses um, that are running and then allows the, the locals who may not have been able to afford what's, what's priced in for, for um, international tourists to, to experience the products that we have. We don't want to discount race or anything like that too much, but we do know that the local domestic tourism is going to rise up first. And as, um, as Gavin said, everyone is going to want to get in their car and do something. And we need to allow our citizens of the province to become tourism ambassadors for our own cities um, and towns within KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape and, and around the country, get online, promote what we have to the outside world and just use, use this time for promote, promote, promote. That, that, is, that is what I'm, I'm suggesting. Graham, thanks so much. Um, Craig, can we get an opinion from your side? Yeah, sure, thanks, David. Um, 
couple of things from my side. One, um, I think it is important. I know we can really, well, certain aspects of, of governments have been really proactive in terms of their messaging, but I think we really need to be careful um, that the messaging that is being put out is not absolute messaging. It's normally based on scenarios or projections. Um, certainly the one that came out from the Department of Tourism and there was a follow-up from SA Tourism where timeframes were projected to be international travel after February 2021 um, caused a huge amount of consternation for our client base overseas. And we had to be at real pains to point out that that was not legislated timeframes from government. That was a projection and a scenario that had been put out there, but it really wasn't clear. We got a lot of people coming through saying, should we cancel all of our bookings until February 2021? When I think all of us know that, well, I've certainly learned that a week is a long time in the pandemic. We've already, based on those timeframes, we, we should be looking at um, level three in September. We're now we're already talking about level three in May. But I think part of the damage has already been done. And it's all very well to have these kind of projections, but let's make very clear that they're a scenario as opposed to an absolute a couple of other important points. I think one is um, the flight aspect is crucially important. Um, without flights and access and linked to that, the opening of borders, um, tourism is a non-starter. Certainly inbound tourism is a complete non-starter. Um, and how we develop that flight scenario, um, whether it's a staggered approach, starting off with domestic flights and how do processes and procedures work domestically? Um, do we refine those? And do we see what kind of appetite there is for clients to fly um, and then start rolling that internationally? Um, or as has been discussed, we create bubbles or certain um, links between countries where we are comfortable as a country having direct links with, um, that we can start expanding international um, flight links with that. That part is the first step. And we can only get to the second step, which is how do we look after people in country and what can we offer them and what can we do once we can get them here? If we can't get them here, there's no point even discussing that. So the focus really initially has to be, can we get flights here and can we get people into borders? Um, and how are we gonna do, um, do that with, um, with government? And then from a DMC perspective, um, there's two sides of it. One is, is flexibility from our suppliers. I think we wanna get a market uh, traveling again, we need flexibility on things like um, booking terms and conditions, on cancellations, on refunds. And people want to know that if they're going to book, they have the ability to change um, at short notice or if the situation changes or if they're not comfortable without any penalties. Otherwise, they're just not comfortable doing that. The flip side of that, we want flexibility, but they also want to know that there is financial security in the chain. So can we as an industry guarantee financial security to people that are paying deposits overseas um, that might be through their agent paying funds to South Africa that might come through to a DMC, might end up with a supplier in advance of clients traveling. Is that deposit secure? Um, can the agent guarantee to them that the, the DMC and the supply chain is going to be there when they actually end up traveling once they've put up, put up their funds? Um, so certainly in terms of financial security, and insurances, can we offer that as an industry? Great, Greg, thanks so much. But it, in many ways, uh, tease you up, Andy. So you're sitting in the UK. Give us, give us, give us a perspective from where you see things, and uh, you know how South Africa may feature in the future. Yeah, sure. So I, I guess the um, the defining feature for us, and I'm I'm, I'm in regular contact with a, a reasonably large pool of other tour operators and we're talking about these things all the time and the defining feature is uncertainty like we just same as you guys we have no clue and as craig says you, you putting any kind of concrete timeline on pointless it, it gets ripped up the second you put it down so we've got no real idea when things might going up or when things are going to start opening up which in turn impacts our staffing levels and things like that and how you know who, how many people we keep and so there's an awful lot of uncertainty and I think the the second point I'd make is that currently at the moment I have no fear for the demand for travel to South Africa in the long term that is that is solid that will come back but I don't know when and the longer it goes on uh, that we're locked down that we can't we can't get tourists out for whatever reason I think 
a you'll start to see tourist habits change like if we if we opened up again in a few weeks time i don't think you'd see the wants and needs of the international traveler change radically from what they were pre-covid but if we're still in the situation in a year's time all of the habits that they've kind of built up over those years will go out the window and they, they will be looking for different things so we as a company and this is in common with a lot of the guys i'm talking with at other companies we're not making really any plans on what the what the recovery will look like what tourists will require when they go overseas how we're going to market to them because at the moment it, it feels like you you can spend an awful lot of time putting together a very detailed plan and in three weeks time you'd rip it up and go no it's not it's not valid anymore it's changed so um the demand I'm, i but I, I the demand will be there in the future the thing that we are probably all most worried about is flights um and you know this is across the globe but if you take S, uh, sa as an example south african airways who knows virgin are in a bit of a pickle ba are retrenching massively those are the three main direct carriers out of the uk if two of them go potentially how are we going to get anybody out and what's going to happen to the airfare and I, I hope that all those airlines right now are buying up fuel futures because they must be peanuts at the moment to offset. Because you know, if if you if you take two thirds of the capacity out of a out of a network, and then you make everyone take the middle row of seats out as well for C nineteen precautions, all you're going to see is airfares doubling, tripling, and then you know, in, in today, I don't think discounting is the way to come out of this. But you know you guys on the ground could discount all you like, but if it costs two grand sterling to get out to South Africa in economy, it doesn't make any difference. But um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of where we're at. I, I, I don't think I've got a lot to offer in terms of certainty or, or this is what we expect. The one thing that I keep coming back to and I keep saying to my team and anyone who listen is demand will recover. And by the middle of next year, all right, we'll be nowhere near what we were, were in terms of forward bookings in January, February. But by the middle of next year, people will be traveling again. There will be a market again. And if we can get to that point, there, there will, you know, there's, there's advantage to be had for sure. Thanks, Andy. Well, I mean, let's, 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 let's speed off that point. And Adrian, I'm going to come back to you just to lead this sort of discussion here. Let's talk timing because, you know, it's great that there may be demand in the middle of next year. Are we going to have a... Uh, are we going to have any product left to to actually uh, sell to people if we have to wait that long? Thank you, David and uh, Graham and, and uh, all the guys. You know, I think it was great input. And you know, just listening to everybody there, you know, the biggest dilemma we've got is that we can't put a time frame to it. So you you ask the question: Who will be around in March, April next year? Um, it's a it's a tough one. I know what we're going through. I know what some of my competitors are going through. You know, it's it's funny in, in times like this where you know you talk to everybody. You know, I've I've talked to probably most people in the industry that are in our sort of uh, end of the market, and you know it's 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 quite sad. You know, because none of us have got an answer. I may just give you an example. Uh, we sit with four boats on the Chobe Zambezi River plus a lodge there. Uh, Botswana has gone into what they call, they were closed down for six months. You know, it was finished a state of emergency. We can't get one person there. So even if we opened up, it doesn't help us. And just to give you a bit of background on that, is that with those boats that we opened there, we created a demand that was never here. Because we, um, um, what happened was, you know, there was no river cruising in Africa besides the Nile. The others had gone, you know. Um, the the Kariba had gone, Lake Victoria had gone, and then we went to those markets, you know, and we got a cruise market. But that market, they came to South Africa, went to Cape Town, went to the Kruger, went to Vic Falls, and then finished on our boats. That was a completely new market. So you know, it's uh, to say, where will we be? I mean, we've had every single cruise cancelled. You know, we can't, and we had a hell of a lot of deposits which we had to refund. So we can't uh, go back to them to say, look, we think we will be back then, because it depends on the region. So the regional market is pretty critical to, and I don't know if my panelists will agree with me, but pretty critical to a lot of the people who have got a diverse product and product in other countries, because we depend on South Africa to feed them. 
So, you know, to ask the question about, and I'm, I'm not a pessimist, believe me, I, I like to be an optimist, but it's hard to be an optimist when you really can't get any sort of idea of when we will be back. Say, so, okay, we open. Let's say we open. As, uh, and as Craig said, we can open uh, maybe in October, November, December. But is there an airline? Is there a single passenger coming from overseas? That's the critical part of it for certainly the top end of the market. And I, I see all the comments coming through about the domestic market. We, uh, and I think it's going to be a great asset to us if everybody does start visiting us domestically and everything. But, uh, you know, again, you need the regional flights. I don't believe that people will drive uh, all the way and, uh, and lose three days of their holiday uh, to go to the Kruger uh, and back from Cape Town. I mean, I'm, I'm just being practical. So I um, just wish that we could uh, find out or get some certainty as to when we think this thing will end. And, you know, obviously we'll look at the international news and everything else that goes on. But, you know, David, your question really was, who's going to be around in, in six or eight months' time? I know a lot of us, you know, there's a lot. And I, I can just be very grateful, probably like Craig, is that, you know, I did this deal with Accor, second biggest hotel group in the world, that they bought 50% of our brand and our management company. They didn't buy the properties. So I'm sitting with the property. So don't think my pain is over. But, I mean, at least it gave us um, some help. And I'll talk to you later about, you know, the, the, the fund that they've, uh, just the hottest, uh, all hottest fund, which they've uh, created, uh, in, it's a 70 million fund, of which uh, we've managed to access some of that through our community conservation fund that they bought our starter to feed communities on it. So this, there are positives there to help us stay in business, to be open when this damn thing uh, uh, goes away. Thank you. Great, Adrian. Does anybody want to come in on that um, from the panel? Sort of yeah, I mean, I'll say something. Yeah. I mean, there, I, was, I, had, I had a chat uh, today with one of um, the top uh, sort of group series providers into the country and uh, you know there is positive movement when it comes to forward bookings you know we're up triple triple than we were in 2019 in, into you know in forward bookings for for next year so of course that's a lot of movement from 29 2020 into 2021 not necessarily new bookings but the trend for the the future looks good and then but uh, you know everyone's concerned about immediate um you know, Andy, you would know that in the UK today there was the the antibody test that's just has uh, just come out, 100% accurate antibody test, which is fantastic. So there does seem to be um, movement when it comes to testing and allowing those people. Firstly, they need to find out if actual antibodies does mean immunity. That's that's the big question. Um, but as as Adrian said, you know, I'm also I also try and be. Uh, positive and you know i just i just think that from all the doom and gloom over the last two months in the past week or so i've noticed a, a kind of a positive shift there does seem to be more positivity more activity going on and um they, they just and they i don't know that's my point of view I, I do see more activity um and and hopefulness out there for perhaps september october we, we start to see something um, whether that's being naive, I don't know, but but I, I do pick that up as a trend. Gab, do you want to come in and just talk a little bit about your, just amplify your point? Because if we are talking about, you know, what Graham's saying, that there may be some movement sort of opening up. I mean, it's, it, it, it's all going to start with the, uh, you know, with the domestic side. Um, I'm also like to get your views just you know, to, apropos what Adrian was saying in terms of airlines, the, the economics of airlines, and if, you know, if, if that means that prices are, are, are really high, although I think we've got a huge opportunity um, around youth travel, and you will know that I've been sort of beating that drum, you know, since we started talking as Sat Societic, um, by just acknowledging the, the underreported um, percentage of, of, our, of our overseas market that does that, that, that was under 32. But if the prices are going to go through the roof, are we not just going to get um, the sort of rich retirees? And doesn't that you know, possibly crowd out a youth market? So two parts there, the domestic side, because you seem to be quite bullish on that, and then the sort of youth market. But you know, how does that work with, with the economics of access possibly becoming more expensive? 
Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, well, I think we've got to look at it, as you say, in two things. First, the first thing is, is it's not only South Africa that's going to have the expensive airlines. Okay, so if they want to go to Australia, it's going to be the same price because it's going to be the same, the same rules and regulations for the COVID-19. So I, I, I think we're competing, we're competing on a, on a leveler playing field, I think. Probably, we just need the flights to fly. And I think the youth, will do, the youth will do the rest because it's going to be the same flying to Thailand, it's going to be the same flying to Australia, which are our, our big destinations. The youth, you know, the, the, the youth are still going to travel because they've got the, a lot of them have got the gap year, you know, and they've only got that year between universities and things like that. So they have to fill and they have to get something in, in that particular year or they're going to miss out before they go to university, etc. Or who knows, they might be able to do their, their university studies from South Africa um, by online because everything will have gone online by then anyway. So, you know doing it in, in country or in another country is another, is another way of looking at things. But certainly I, 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 do, really, I do really think that, um, you know, we've got other ways to move around the country. You know, we've got, we have the BAS bus, um, which, which goes up and down the country. Um, the FITs, you know, the, the higher, higher car people, you know, four, four youngsters jumping in a car going up there. I think we're gonna see an increase in that certainly because then they can stop off in different areas on, on, on the way around the country and see different things. So, and I also think as well, because the, 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 local, the local youth, they're also crazy, um, stuck up indoors and whatever. They're also gonna to want to travel. And, they, and as long as we promote ourselves as, as youth travel and welcome uh, local youth into our, into our backpackers and hostels and uh, some of our volunteer projects, I really do think that there's that we're going to see a little bit more traction on that, uh, Dave, um, than perhaps the earlier than the international traveller. And somebody mentioned earlier as well that the international traveller pays, you know, big bucks to come to this country, but the youth travel usually spend a lot longer in country than than the older people as well. So that's the other thing. Um, you know, I mean, I'm from the language travel industry. Our average stay is six point. 6.4 weeks, I think, at this present moment. It was at the present moment in time. So we're getting them in for a longer period of time, doing the trips, doing the tours and pre and post education courses. So yeah, I think, I think regionally, um, the regional travel is, is, is something quite important. And definitely the, the, the youth are still are going to travel. Look, I mean, they go to all the places where we had those horrible tsunamis um, across the world and they were the first ones back. So I, I really think that these guys are going to be, and yes, it's going to affect my market. It's going to not, it's not going to affect the, 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 the upper end, the middle to upper end properties, the guest houses and the hotels, but certainly the hostels, the reasonable, reasonably priced. And families, I really do think that families are going to travel at some stage or other as well. Okay, Dave. Great, um, Andy, thanks, Gav. You know, what come, I think the other point, Gav, as well, I mean, the, the sort of overriding one is that this uh, virus clubs older people far heavier than it clubs younger people. So there's hopefully a you know a more intrepid market out there that's that's um, just not as not as sort of risk averse as the uh, as the retired market. But Andy, you wanted to come in on a comment there. It's just there's a couple of things really I think around you know potential timings of opens and openings and so on, um, as well as the issue of air access and. And demand, and we're assuming that the demand is going to be there. If governments say, like our government is currently saying, no, you can't go anywhere, and if you do go somewhere, you've got to be quarantined for 14 days when you come back, it, it, it kills it. And I think where we're particularly handicapped in the UK is the representation of outbound tourism at government level is poor. Um, we, you know, our lobbying is is has been spectacularly ineffectual in some respects over the last eight weeks you know ten weeks representing the travel industry to to government so the government doesn't understand the the the, the imperative of of making a plan of working out how you can get people going they don't seem to be that much interest in it so that's point one I, and you know i i don't want to be pessimistic but what we're currently considering as a business is contacting all of our clients due to travel anywhere in the world up until December and saying, look, we think there's a very good chance you are not going to get away. Can we postpone you now? 
and that's our thinking and our, that thinking is broadly in concert with most of the other people I'm talking to we are not expecting significant departures anytime until maybe Christmas but Q1 next year so that's that's that point and then the other one was just to repeat kind of what you said that certainly for our core our core demographic is the 50 60 70 year olds um and they are most isolated or insulated from the economic impact of, of the c19 shutdowns because they've all they've got their money in you know pension pots and, and housing but they're also the most vulnerable to the disease and so that's definitely going to kind of in, kind of keep their recovery at a lower level a slower level um potentially until there's a vaccine so uh, it's like i say it, the frustrating thing in all of this is that the demand is there but there's several barriers to it being released and 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 yeah, yeah those barriers sit at government level and they sit with the virus itself and vaccines great yeah yeah, yeah. Um, um uh, interesting uh, and yeah also i had this discussion today um on age demographics um with one of the u.s operators their question was whether the luxury market would would be the last to come back or not given that the luxury market tends to be um more older than than the younger market and part of the argument that they put forward was that the luxury traveler although they are older um can afford to fly business class they can, in, in ultra luxury senses, sometimes take private jets and private planes. Um, when they're in country, they can afford things like private bidders and exclusive use and private game vehicles. So their points of contact along the way can be eliminated financially. Um, and in that way, it might actually, it might, um, they might actually return sooner than, than we think. That was one viewpoint um, put across. But it was coupled with whether trip insurance or travel insurance available to travelers going forward and this is now separate to tour operator <laughs> insurance which is going to be another whole topic but individual travel insurance for clients if they do fall sick in country or they have COVID-19 symptoms will they be able to get insurance cover that will repatriate them or look after them um, and that would be a major concern sitting with the insurance companies the second point in terms of recovery um, was I think as a country, we also need to be able to show that we're open for business. Um, and people aren't going to come unless there are things, attractions I'm talking about, like is Table Mountain open? Um, is Robben Island open? Um, what is the situation with restaurants and bars? Um, one of the main attractions for coming to Cape Town is the food and wine scene. Are you going to, if you come out, if you can get here, are you going to be able to access restaurants and bars um, as part of your city stay? And if you can't, what is our alternative for that? So if restaurants are not going to be able to open or bars aren't going to be able to that, do we have creative solutions? Are we doing private picnics in the wine? Are we doing uh, um, small setups for lunches for, for family groups or something? We've got to be able to show that when they're here, it's not a wasteland that they can't enjoy um, under normal circumstances. Um, which I think in part will, as Gavin was, uh, was saying, um, can be driven by the domestic market. So the domestic market is really your forerunner. Um, I don't want to call us the, the guinea pigs, but are we the guys that are going to go into the bars and restaurants, make sure that, they, that there is an appetite for, for communal dining and, and socializing, getting up Table Mountain, standing all close together in a cable car. And if there is that confidence domestically, then that confidence will be projected internationally as well. It's a yeah, great point there, Craig. But I mean, can we just sort of spend some time on that, Adrian? I'd like to, you know, bring you in here and just get points. You know, the the first two sessions, you know, the one on Tuesday and and, and Wednesday, we spent a lot of time on that timing, the access issues, and I think they 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 are seminally important, and we're not moving away from that. But but Craig's touched on such an interesting point that we haven't really spent much time in these webinars on. Um, and you know we've got to do all of these things concomitantly. I think Mandisa made the point on the uh, on the uh, sort of chat line there that you know it's not like we do uh, uh, you know we only do one thing at once. We've got to got to multitask here. You know what what does our, our you I mean what are our USPs in a post COVID world and what should we be focusing on from a supply side? Um, you know that would hopefully put us in a good position going forward. And and that you know after Adrian guys if you want to just raise your hand and just sort of chip in on that. But I don't think we, we, 
we've spent enough time in the webinars to date on this issue, and I think it's I think it's quite quite important. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I think that you know um, we have a, a couple of things that we've come up with. Is you know stay away from being generic, uh, stay away from sort of a look-alike product, and um, rather be inventive and different. You know, and I know that those are pretty bold statements, but you know we've got to come out of the box somehow and work out. You know, we got to present to to the local people. We got to present to the world of why they need to come here. And I mean, we've done a job. We all have done this, but we know that our tourism numbers are not nearly what they, they could or should be. You know, and we can say thank you to our great politicians who have zero clue about business, you know, and went to the birth certificate thing and uh, did everything possible to screw up our industry. Those of that have been in it for as long as I have would have gone through all the pain. You know, and it's just, for me, it's quite sad that, you know, um, I don't think any of us sit around the table and say, you know, we all criticize politicians and we say, you know, they should be doing this and they should be doing that. But shouldn't we, as business, I mean, if I was a politician, the first thing that I would do, certainly the Minister of Tourism, would do, and I'm not sure how, whether she does or doesn't, but certainly be more involved with the people who are in the game. And, you know, I'm just so pleased that you guys have got together and that we're going to do one uh, paper to them, you know, and let's just for, let's hope that they read it, you know, but, you know, there, there's, there's so many things that um, we all sit frustrated about, you know. Can't we get back in certain things? Or can't we start doing certain things? And as you were asking the question, you know, when we open, it's how we're going to be different. You know, and David, there's a couple of things. There's, first of all, is, you know, what have we done to survive? Have we looked after the people that are near us? And if I could give you an example of, of what we're busy doing, is that, uh, you know, we have two lodges in the Amphalosi Game Reserve. And they're in the community areas, and the community is 100% dependent on the success of those two lodges. Well, at the moment, you know, we're basically we're lucky we've got two, so the people that are employed there, and we put well over 100 people there, are, are benefiting a bit. So, what, what happened is, and I mentioned this um, fund that was set up, the All Artist Fund uh, by ACOR, and um, we managed to put a proposal forward whereby are we going to be able to assist the families that work for us the communities that are involved, and we want that, that part of our business to be able to come to us when we've finished and gone through all this, to be proud of what we did for them. So in other words, it's not a case of us just surviving as a business. We've got to try and work out a way in which we can make the people that depend on us also survive. And this initiative comes through what I mentioned earlier, the Community Conservation Fund Africa. And just to give you a little bit of background, that was when I sold out to ACOR, or sold 50% to ACOR as a partner. One of the criteria for doing that was that I said to them, we want to make a difference in terms of conservation. And conservation will not exist if we don't embrace communities. So we've got to involve the communities far more. So you know, I know probably it's a roundabout way of answering your question, but we're trying to look at all our product and see how we can benefit the community in this very sad state of affairs where, you know, I don't know, 70, 80 percent of our country, you know, it depends on so little to survive, you know. So I think that if we don't do something like that, far more people are going to die out of starvation and everything else, then they're going to die from the virus. So I, I'm just, um, you know, I really am passionate about trying to uh, protect what I believe to be one of our major assets, and that's our wildlife. So you asked the question, where are we going to be? Well, let me tell you that if we don't protect the wildlife, one of our assets will go. And I've seen it. It's happening in Africa. So um, we're lucky that we have been able to uh, raise some funds, some significant funds, but we've got to raise one hell of a lot more. And, you know, when I said to ACOR, when we raised the CCFA, they've got over 100 million members in the loyalty program. I said to them, all I want is a dollar a member to come in every year to give us a fund that can make a difference. So, you know, I know that I've gone about conservation and that, but this stage of my life, the two things that are important to me are conservation and education. So, you know, we have the university, which we're trying to also keep surviving, the only place where you can do a, a wildlife semester in conservation and lodge management, and the only place in Southern Africa where you can do a degree in hospitality based in Port Alfred. So, um, there's a lot of good things out there that we have to make survive. We have to find a way of how we're going to get them to survive. 
And David, it's up to you and your people to get together and get this uh, government of ours to recognize that the tourism industry and the hospitality industry is a major asset in this country. And they have to help us or they have to listen to us. And I don't know how we're going to happen to, how we're going to get it, but it's time that they listen. Thank no, you. No, Adrian, I, think, I think that's such a dream I'll come to you now. I just think that's such an important point. And I mean, it's, it's, it's laudable that you, you know, a lot of people simply go to the physical attractions. But I think that, you know, what you said is that it's wildlife, but what underpins wildlife are communities and, and um, you know, that are supported through that, through that whole point. And I mean, something I, I haven't made on, on in these four yet, which I think is a very powerful rallying call that we need to, um, you know, get up there. And it's, you know, but when you look at what, you know, you referenced the uh, two ways they do, they do things very simply, very well. And, um, you know, they're equivalent to SATSA is called ATIC, the Australian Tourism Export Council. So they've got export in there, which is, which is, which is useful. So they get the government to realize that's an export sector. And then their byline under that um, is representing the $42 billion tourism industry. So they, whenever their logo goes up anywhere, the message of the value that they contribute comes through. And just a small, I mean, Colin Bell came up with it, and it really is a quick and dirty back of a cigarette box, but it's a powerful thing, is that one in every seven South Africans puts food on the table every night because of the tourism industry. One in seven. Um, the, the little bit of the, the sort of uh, rudimentary maths behind that, it is it, in an urban area, one job creates, uh, sustains four to five people. But you'll know in up in Umfalozi and those areas, one job is sustaining 12 to 15 people. Could be as much as that. Tourism indirectly employs 1.5 million. And you just do the maths. It's a conservative figure. If you divide the 1.5 into the into into our population, you know, it's it, you know, and if we take a conservative national average, that one job supports six people, then one in every seven South Africans is eating every night because of the tourism industry. And if this industry goes, that means every seventh South African is going to starve. So you know, these are the sort of bald, BHAG, the big hairy audacious sort of numbers we've got to put up that actually support um, our, our sort of argument, but then we've got to back it up with, with a lot more of the, uh, you know, of, of the empirical data about where we're going as a sector and what will happen. And, you know, you're fortunate, Adrian, I think, and, and, and savvy that you've got the link with Apple, but, you know, a lot of the other guys are, are flying solo. They don't have, you know, big brothers and sisters behind them, and, and, and that is deeply concerning going forward. We came out of the Tuesday session from Rob Moore and Dave Ryan. So, you know, I think we've got a, we've got a, we've got a very, um, we've got a big job to do and we've got to do it bloody quickly because this thing is, this thing is so fluid. What, what is true today is not necessarily going to be true next Thursday. You know, we've, we've really got to get on with the job. But um, as I said in the beginning of the program, we've, we've got a good partnership, we've got a proper structure, and we've got a couple of key things we're going to be doing, doing very quickly. Graham, off to you. So yeah, to um, yeah, so, you know, I, I know that we've discussed a lot of the de-risking strategies, and I think that's going to be very important as well uh, to instill confidence in the, in the international traveler to, to come. You know, particularly for group travel, we're going to need to be very clear as to how the coaches are, are going to be sanitized, um, temperature checking of, of guests. That's, that's all going to be very critical. So I know um, that we have, as SATSA, done quite a lot of work in, 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 in the recommendations of, of what can be put into place. Uh, Natalia, I don't know whether you've got access to any of that now that you can share on the chat, but maybe afterwards, um, because I'm also getting a lot of questions about what, what can we do, what do we need to do in terms of sanitization and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's also going to be very important when, you know, Ryanair put out a fantastic video of how they intend to, um, you know, sanitize the aircrafts because they apparently are flying from the 1st of July, 40% of their um, destinations. And I watched the video that they did, very clear, very concise, very confidence instilling um, into how they're going to try and protect uh, passengers. I see Natalie has, uh, Natalia has put it up. Thank you very much. So um, if everyone can just log on and, and have a read. I know there's some international, I see on the, there's some international operators on the, on the, on the webinar today that are listening in. And, um, and I've asked the same question. What, what is South Africa doing to, 
to prepare itself for the when the tourists arrive. Um, so if everyone can just bear that in mind with their own products, that I think would, would be good as well. Well, Graham, just to give you, I mean, very important point you make, but just to give you an update on that. So we, we engaged in this whole process through the associations to develop those protocols. So the, the ones that are put up are the draft ones, but the Tourism Business Council has now published the final, the final sort of protocols that have taken inputs from, from all over. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that up and running. But as I said in my introduction, we need to set up a task team that, 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 that starts focusing on how do we operationalize those protocols. So it's fine that everybody can say, you know, every hotel can say, cool, I subscribe to that, but how is that pleased? You know, do we wait for government to send inspectors out? And uh, I would say perish the thought. We don't want to wait for that. We want to get into a form of self-regulation where we can say, you know, um, we're managing this on our own. Teresa um, Emmerich, who, who heads up Knightsbridge, has, has put out a really good um, paper on this and, and, and has some really key suggestions. You know, she represents and, and, and deals with 8,000 guest houses around the country. So there's, there's some really good thinking, but we're going to put that, work, that, that little work team together on this. And, and we're hoping within a week or two, we'll have a, a, a really clear sense that we can take to government that says, guys, this is how we're going to do it across the entire value chain. You know, from the time you board a plane to get into an airport, you get into a transfer, game lodge, hotel, zip line, you know, here are all the protocols along, along the, uh, the value chain and, and, and this is how we can, how we can do it um, safely. But Adrian, do you just want to come back to you without, without sort of uh, asking you to dominate, but, I read that, um, and I may have been mistaken, but ACL was also done. You know, you you locked into them. They've done some some innovative work around protocols as well, have they not? Yeah, they've, we've come out with um, a reset our menu of services. So you know, they've obviously we we're working with them internationally and all over to uh, reset our menu of services. But you know, it's it's not a it's not that easy. You know, when you consider as um, I think. Um, uh, Graham was saying is that, you know, you're going to get into a car, you're going to get into an aeroplane, then you're going to get to the hotel. Uh, the protocols can't be identical. So, you know, game lodge is going to be, you're going to go on a game drive, you know, how do you sit on that? So it's, it's a complicated uh, set uh, of menus that we're going to have to come up with. So I don't think there's a, an easy one to just say, look, this is what we're going to do as far as the lodge is concerned. Because, you know, some lodges have different vehicles, some lodges do a walk, some lodges do different things. So, it's it's not that easy, but you know I don't want to complicate everything. So we're just trying to do what we think will be appropriate for us. What happens when you get on our boats in the Zambezi? You know that's a different protocol. We've got to go through all sorts of things. You've got to get on a little boat to get on the big boat. It's it's a complicated thing. So uh, I think that um, you know, thankfully with our partner is that they they are coming up with a lot of innovative ideas. But you've got to understand they're not. They're not involved in the in the type of product that we're involved in. They're mainly city hotels, and that's the reason they bought us because they bought a part of us was because they saw that the, the world is changing, that people want adventure, they want experiential travel, and uh, hopefully that we'll be there to uh, look after those people when they arrive. So um, you know, we've also sort of come up with a, a saying: is say, uh, you know, let's not look for the answers; they're likely to come. Uh, what we're saying is let's invent an answer. You're likely to get it right because we're in an unknown world. You know, so we've got to start doing some, some things on our own. So it's, it's tough. It's tough out there. There's no doubt about it. But as I say, we're trying to keep our team motivated with all these initiatives that we're coming up to up with. And you'll see a big one uh, that will be announced next week with the CCFA and our community involvement. And I really am passionate about trying to protect our wildlife here. You know, it's, 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 it's going to be chronic because it's a lot easier for a guy in a community to get over the fence and go and uh, shoot a, a, an animal there for his food than it is to go and break in somewhere and steal food in, uh, in a city. So, you know, we've got, and we've got to protect our assets, David. That's the most important thing is, uh, you know, we've got some assets that the rest of the world haven't got. We better make sure they're there after this. Thank you. Guys, can I... With your permission, can we swing on to Craig? Craig's point he made in his introduction. Um, we did have a, um, a bit of a session on this yesterday. We had Ilana from Travel Smart Crews done a lot of work, but it'd be nice just to you know 
get Andy's view, um, and Graham, you could also come in just on 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 the uh, contractual side of things and whether what we you know what do we need to change? I, I know it's not look, and, and let's let me just preface this entire conversation. There are no easy answers, but it, I think we we certainly have an opportunity to relook at the way that we transact along the value chain and. I think we've got to be open to that. So we, we've started the, the SATSA discourse. Um, we've had some, some sort of key opinion pieces from Alana, from Anna Fechter, from Martin Best, Colin Bell, Ryan Powell's come into it, and Dave Ryan and Maya from Go to Africa had, a, I thought, an incredibly readable um, piece, whether you agree with it or not. So, you know, there's been a lot of opinion on this, but, you know, while we're on the webinar and we've, we've got Andy here, you know, how do you see that changing? And maybe, uh, Craig, do you want to just sort of expound on your on your earlier points, and then Andy, you just you you, you, and you can jump in and and uh, give your two pence if that's not uh, too much of a pun. There we go. Uh, okay, those names are a tough act to follow, especially when, especially Alana, because I know she's got a lot to say on on the matter. I I think a couple of things with I without repeating everything that probably has been said before. But one of the core things that came out of this whole process is um, quite a fundamental misunderstanding um, of each other in the chain. Um, and certainly a lack of empathy along the chain as well. And that goes from the supplier side to the DMC side, to the agent side, and even to the consumer side. And I think everyone in the chain thought that we understood each other's business models very well. And it turned out that we actually didn't understand each other's business models very well. And one of the things that almost everybody thought was that someone else in the chain was making a ton more money than them. Um, and why should they carry the can? When I think pretty much everybody exists on a, on a really low margin in the industry. Um, so I think part of, the, part of the discussion is understanding more about where everybody fits in the chain and what value they add in the chain and the constraints and difficulties that each person has in the chain from the supplier side and i know from the supplier guys on you know on, on participating in adrian um i know a lot of the suppliers feel that um they're often left holding the can they're the last one in the in the chain and, and everything falls on them um then you have your dmc uh who's stuck in the middle between the, the agent and the supplier You've got the agents overseas who are really constrained by consumer laws in their own country. And they're the ones having to deal with the clients that are phoning them directly on the ground and asking for refunds. So everybody comes under enormous pressure. Um, and I think that when we go forward, determining terms and conditions, and <clears throat> I think there's going to be a lot of discussion on terms and conditions going forward. I think those have to be equitable. Um, in terms of how, how everybody in the chain is accommodated correctly. I know what is going to happen. The suppliers are going to want to say in a contract going forward that in the event of this situation happening ever again, they will get the monies that are due to them. And I know what's going to happen on the agent side, that they will say in the event of this happening ever again, they don't want to pay any cancellation fees because they're constrained by the consumer laws in their own country. And we have two very, very disparate positions, we're going to have to find common ground um, between the two somewhere along the way. And Andy, yeah. do you want to come in and uh, give us a perspective from, uh, from, from the source? I mean, this is, um, yeah, this is maybe the thorniest issue that, that all of this has chucked up. Um, I'd echo an awful lot of what Craig says there. The realisation I've come to is that in a horrible way this crisis has made a lot of us very selfish we're all fighting 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 for survival and that means kicking the pain either way on the, on on the value chain and and trying to kind of protect yourselves and that's that's horrible um having said that certainly amongst operators i'm talking to it's not that the supply side of the chain has has been forgotten and there there are discussions we're having about how can we ensure that our suppliers aren't getting completely stiffed on this because we need them on the other side you know um, so it's, it's it isn't it isn't quite man, every man for himself and dog eat dog uh, there is a, a willingness to, to sort of talk about it at the very least i think 
what I'd say is at the moment from consumers who are who are still inquiring about traveling we are we, we are dealing with new inquiries financial security of us and and uh, as their operator and financial security of their funds is not a massively high priority now that might be because people who are considering traveling at the moment are a self-selecting group of sort of pioneering people and it's not a major concern for them the, the the opinion and it is just an opinion i don't think it's backed up extensively with surveys or anything but the opinion amongst tour operators i hear from is that uh the client is going to want much greater flexibility going forward they want they're going to want to know that in a c19 parallel situation they're going to get their money back uh, that has been a big battleground for tour ops in the uk over the last 10 weeks is, is the refunds issue because for those who don't know under british law uh Package, package travel regulations. Uh, the second that the foreign office said, you know, you can't send anyone overseas, it advised against all uh, non-essential travel. Everybody who had a holiday booked with an imminent departure date, we were obliged by law to refund in full immediately or within 14 days. Now that didn't really happen, but that was what the law says. And that's, what's, that's what we have to deal with as Craig was saying. So it's from flexibility around booking conditions, I think is, it's almost as much for the operator and the agent's peace of mind as it is for the client's peace of mind. The other thing, and I know one of the ideas that's been kicked around is, is some form of escrow accounting. Um, so that at least everybody on the, on the, on the chain can see that when that money comes in to us as the operator, uh, it is being held in escrow for that supplier and the supplier knows that they're going to get their chunk of it in the end. Um, the issue I get, I think with that is, is, it's just complex and tricky. And for smaller companies like us, the admin involved in, in escrow accounts and so on is, is just unduly burdensome, especially as Craig says, we're all operating on thin margins. We don't have the fat to be able to go and do that. The bigger companies who could actually do that escrow accounting much more willingly are generally a little bit more hardball and don't want to give any of their money away to anyone if they don't have to. So it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, so, uh, if, uh, if there was a kind of an escrow model, I think that was simple and easy and had a low admin burden, you, you, there might be some take up on that. Um, but if not, you're going you're gonna to get massive resistance, I would say, from operators and agents. One thing that I've started to, to think about and, and, and talk to a few people about, and it, it goes to a point Craig made, is do we need, as we emerge out of this, to actually put up margins so that we can ring fence more money the, the the way that the supply chain is locked up in terms of refunds is entirely because the vast majority of us are not sitting on piles and piles of cash and so when refund demands come in on mass like this you just can't service them and so it, it just comes to gridlock if we all had a bit more cash in reserve you could make it flow a little bit better and so i wonder whether you know the consumer is going to have to accept that one of the one of the costs to them of greater flexibility and, and greater chance of getting their money back in a situation like this is higher prices. And I wonder whether it, it, that, that's maybe where we have to take it. It's certainly something we're talking about. I mean, other ideas we, that are being kicked around, for example, you know, for us trying to do our bit to secure our cash at least, um, is, can, is there any way when we bill clients that we can ring fence an amount of that invoice as a management fee or a service fee or an arrangement fee that sits outside of the package travel regs so we know that that money at least is safe and again that just gives us more ring fenced money and it enables us a to release more money to suppliers if this ever happens again and b refund more clients if it ever happens again um so that's just some thoughts but I, as craig said my god this is a hell of an issue and i i really i don't know what the answer is i, I would say and repeat amongst the people i'm talking to there is a willingness to try and work out how we can make sure that we're, we're not all at each other's throats if this ever happens again and that there is enough fat to go around that we can make sure that there's money flowing up and down the chain um but how how you do that i don't know and you know you're talking about things here in the uk that would require legislative change and i just i, I can't see a consensus being arrived at um I'm, I'm a bit i'm a bit cynical and a bit pessimistic about that i can't see a consensus being arrived at that makes for legislative change and 
if 80 percent of the industry says okay well we're going to put up our margins so that we have this fat so that we can grease the, the wheels of the supply chain 20 percent are always going to come and undercut and go on a price led proposition and that drags most of us back down into that in, into that kind of game and, and it's so yeah i'm afraid beyond saying flexibility is going to be appreciated any solution needs to be simple and there is a willingness to talk about it that's as much as i can say from our side at the moment right well andy thanks but natalia do you want to i mean do you have any i mean you were managing the whole escrow webinar thing i mean any insights from from that discussion that may be may be uh, relevant um other than I learned how to spell escrow, you mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very interesting discussions, actually. I moderated both a webinar and a virtual meeting with um, industry stakeholders, not just in South Africa, but um, also quite a few from the UK because we pushed it out through ATA. There were a lot of, um, there's a lot of misinformation or people don't understand what an escrow is, first of all. and not understanding when they're going to get paid their money and realizing that there are actually a set of triggers that are put in place independently so that when this happens, then you will get paid out. Um, so there was a lot of concern over the fairness of it, um, the administrative burden, as Andy well pointed out, and then the cost, you know, the, the cost of administering an escrow, uh, having the reputation of being quite an expensive exercise. Um, the feedback that I've received from industry in South Africa has not been particularly positive towards um, having an escrow. Um, I think the DMCs are more in favor of it than the suppliers have been. Um, that said, however, I was quite curious to their response because in my view, you know, we're talking about um, instilling trust in the customer and and Andy was talking about it earlier making sure that our customers trust us and that they know that their money is in trust so surely an escrow would be one of the most customer centric uh, customer positive things that you would potentially do to prove to them that South Africa is serious about keeping their money safe and that it's not about us it's actually about them so that for me was my departure point as someone that actually doesn't work in the channel, but I'd be curious to get the perspective of both Craig, Andy and Graham actually on, on that comment. Yeah, I can, I can quickly jump in here, Natalia. There's, there's three, and it's important to remember here not to shoot the messenger because I see on the participants there is, um, low, there's overseas tour operators, there's suppliers, there's GMCs, there's a huge, uh, probably every sector of, of the, of the chain here. So um, a, no, a non-refundable deposit at the time of booking. I think it's important to remember that particularly now that people are, as, as Andy said as well, the buzzword has to be flexibility. If you're going along with a quote and you're saying you have to put a thousand pounds down now for this large non-refundable, even if there's a resurgence of COVID, I'm sorry, that's, that's the terms. Or you can go to the lodge down the road and they aren't doing that. Um, you know, I think the, from a consumer point of view, it's, it would seem obvious what their choice would be. The, the more flexible option of not, of not risking any of their money. So again, I just say this is the suggestions that are coming from people who are dealing with the actual traveler. And it is, it does, it will involve a lot of debate going forward, but that's what I think certainly needs to be borne in mind when, when thinking about the non-refundable deposit issue, is that people are not gonna be wanting to do that anymore considering what it's caused now. Secondly, the cancellation fees, right? When, when a booking needs to be canceled, who is actually the person canceling? Is it the, is it the traveler who cannot get you um, because there's no flights, there's a travel ban and, and that kind of stuff? or is the lodge itself who is closed? So who's triggered the cancellation? Who's, who's canceled? So of course the cancellation fee, absolutely agree to that if the guest is canceled, but in this situation, the guest is not canceled. It's the, the actual property that has been forced to cancel the booking because they are in fact not open. So they can't charge a fee for something that, that you in a sense have, have done yourself because you were forced to, to cancel the booking because you're not operational. So that is something that needs to be borne in mind as well. And secondly, uh, thirdly, when it comes to 2021 rates, we all know, and there are overseas operators on here as well, that 
we all know that the RAND has dropped, what, 20, 30% since this started. The argument from, from a South African supplier point of view is that we, we need to put up rates, we need to claw back all the money we've lost this year. Your guests are still going to pay less in pounds or dollars or euros because of it if you, if you charge now. That kind of falls away because as the overseas operators will tell you, they do not have enough money to forward buy the currency now to guarantee them that rate. And who knows in August next year what the RAND exchange rate will be. So the risk there lies with them. So when we're saying, yes, but the RAND's tanked, how can you, how can you be angry about a 10% increase when essentially when it's gone down 30%, you're still making a 20% cheaper, if that's crude maths. I'm not sure if that works out, but that's kind of the, kind of the, the feedback. Everyone in this room probably is making money out of margin. So when, when we go to suppliers and say, hold the rates in order to close the booking and secure bookings for next year, by asking you to have a lower rate, it means that I, as a, a, or my company and Craig's company and everyone else's company, in fact, makes less. And everybody overseas, we make less money. So we, we, we're not saying it because we want to be more profitable and greedy. We're saying it because we know that that's what will close the deal because that's what we're being told by people who on the ground. So... As I say, don't shoot the messenger. These, this is feedback that I think we're, we're all getting from overseas operators and the people that are actually dealing with the person who's putting the credit card down as to what they feel will make them more comfortable in booking. So a rate hold that does not require a non-refundable deposit should COVID-19. And if the lodge is closed down, there cannot be any mention of a, a fee of paying a fee for, 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 a, for, a, for a lodge that's, that's not operational. Graham, As thanks. I said, yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, the, guys, um, the thorniest of all issues. So we, I think there's a separate discussion which we are going to facilitate post the discourse. We're going to try and get a lot of key guys into, into a workshop on this. Um, I think that, you know, we, we've got to emerge with some form of consensus sort of going forward. But, you know, I think a lot of level heads are, 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 are coming to the fore and um, I think we'll get there. But we, we are cognizant of time. We're going to hand over, to, I'm going to hand over to Nat to just facilitate the questions. But I was going through the questions and I just want to say how's it to a, a, a great mate of mine and a longtime supporter of South Africa, Ash Sofat from SOMAC. And he makes some good points. Well, I mean, he wasn't asking questions. He was just making some good points, saying um, he's a lot more bullish, saying that airlines will make it uh, affordable. It's in their interest to do so. And he says there is demand for South Africa. There are bookings there. And um, I think he's, he's just giving us a, a, a bit of a sort of bullish view going forward. So thanks so much for that, Ash, and, and nice to have you with us. Nat, let me go back to you, and you can handle the question session. Thanks, David. And thank you to everyone who has been so prolific on the chat. This has been a really great chat today. Really appreciate it. We will collate everything that has pulled through from the chat. And thank you, um, Ash, for posting those comments on our Q&A as well. So I'm going to switch over to Heine. Uh, Heine has said niche markets and specific groups will be low-hanging fruit in the coming months. So I am going to throw that one out to Gavin. Gavin, talk to us about niche markets. Why do you think that niche markets and specific groups, I mean, you represent edutourism, for example. Um, I know within the SATS Youth Stable, we have voluntourism as well, which is a niche, a very niche um, area. Adventure tourism. Tell us how, um, how you believe they're going to be hanging fruit and more importantly, what we can do to instill trust among them that we are a safe and viable destination. Thanks, Natalie. Well, as you, as you know, I think everybody is going to be fed up of being cooped up. And, you know, people are just looking for, for, for different things. And when you speak to the volunteer tour operators, they're coming down here, you know, they're doing the wildlife projects, you know, as Adrian, um, the conservation types of stuff as well, which they're interested in, which is a worldwide, worldwide um, thing nowadays. Everybody wants to do that, put on their CVs that they've done some volunteering, whether it would be with children, whether it would be with animals. We certainly think, and speaking to the volunteer operators, that um, the, the 
the volunteer projects in townships and things like that are going to be quite a way off because of the, of the safety and, and um, the protocols that are required for COVID-19. But they certainly feel that the first things that are going to open up, again, the low-hanging fruit, if we can get international travellers in and local travellers, are going to be the <coughs> conservation projects which these people um, you know, want to do. So certainly the volunteer side of things is good. Education as well. I think education is, is um, not particularly low hanging fruit because you know most of our most of the schools, um, language schools in Cape Town and in the whole country. In you know you've got BLI there in the Eastern Cape. Um, you know there with with Sean, we rely on um, internationals to come in. So you know we have got the aviation industry. That's another good thing. So we can look at the aviation English side of things. But certainly, experiential travel is the is one of the things which we all we all do at some stage. Don't probably realise that we are doing it, but there's a big potential there to to open this out to the local population and to get involved. And I think now this whole COVID nineteen thing has brought the the camaraderie of, of of everybody looking after each other, feeding each other has been has been a good thing. And so I I feel that um, what Heine says, you know, our some of the projects that our our backpackers do up on the on the on the wild coast, the you know the tourist guides that they bring on, and this type of thing is so important for the communities and community life. Um, it, it's it's got to be one of our main um, focuses, I think. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Well, we could probably spend a webinar unpacking what we should be doing to focus on those niche yeah. markets. But Heine, sure. thank you for raising that point and perhaps a challenge to Heine um, and Satsa Youth is to come up with some suggestions on how we can actually make sure that that market is, is catered for and that we're developing trust there. Um, we received a question by email and I'm actually going to ask Graham to unmute himself because I'd like him to respond to this particular question. And that is around the role um, of tourism funding, lobbying and encouraging the likes of KwaZulu-Natal tourism, Durban tourism and the KZN economic tourism sector. How do we um, as SATSA lobby on behalf of our members in the KwaZulu-Natal area to engage with these entities and see how we can... Uh, see how we can actually put a little bit of pressure on them to start looking at a destination marketing plan because you know you can't disappear and come back you've got to stay even if you stay in a different way so what can we do from a SATSA perspective well i have regular meetings with uh, tkzn and urban tourism so what i would suggest is you know um one like david or hanali just joining that in and and because they, they particularly now, they, they're very open to working with us. In fact, um, I had a meeting on Monday with Durban Tourism and another one with the, with the MEC task team that I'm on on, on Monday. You know, I, th I think that a lot of work is being done that isn't being noticed or, or recognized because it's still in the preparation stage. So um, I, did, I did point out that it is probably best to highlight that as soon as possible as to the work in the background that has been done. That's why I, I wanted, I don't know if any of them on now, but it is important to note that we have met with them. They have met with the mayor in terms of the blue flag beaches, the, um, the cleanliness of the city. That's all been brought in. And I did point out to them that we all need a timeline. You know, the whole, we're looking into it is, is not cutting it. We don't, we, we want to know what is being done by when and by who and how. Um, so, yes, there is a lot of work being done. And as Satsa, I'm fighting the, the case with them. Very, very lovely people, very well-intentioned, uh, very, uh, you know, always willing to, to listen and, and help. We need to just make sure that the message from the industry is being heard by them. I, I do my best to, to convey that. But I do think that maybe, Natalia, maybe you can even join in one of the meetings I have with them. We want to get the National Department of Tourism, um, Saan Gidi as well, he's joined us for a few meetings just to talk about what's happening with the domestic side, because as much as we are you know, focusing on the inbound side, there's a lot of domestic work that can be done as well. And I think what we can do is just get, get, a, get a blueprint of what's been done, what's been discussed already, and send that out to the members, perhaps for feedback, is it enough? What more, what more do we want to know? That, that kind of thing. So we are more than happy to do that. They are happy to do that. 
we can have another one of these uh, webinars with with the with the KZN uh, or and Eastern Cape if you want members uh, with them to uh, ask questions directly. We had a we had a meeting with them a few a months ago uh, in January. Um, but yeah, if people want to know what they're doing and how they can help, then I think it's it's best that we just convene another meeting with them, invite and invite the, the panelists here too, and and some of the some of the uh you know the members but I, I did suggest things like on on our on our facebook pages maybe having a daily choosing a daily um supplier or a partner of ours or a hotel restaurant activity doing like a quiz engaging people where they can win a stay or a high tea or a whatever voucher to, to use when everything's back online just to get that engagement and make local uh, a Durban and KZN residents become ambassadors for the region. So that is one thing I'm hoping to get up and running quite soon. But there's a lot of work going on. We just need to tell everyone about it. David, uh, wanted to say I, something? Yeah, I can just come in there because I think one of the other, I mean, really grateful to Graham for that interface and that, 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 that thing. But just in terms of the practical things we can do, because I think that's what our members want to know. So what practically is going to be put in place by any engagement with provincial associations. So we pioneered this whole thing of the mega fam um, idea with the garden route. So we've got a good model with Westgrove. We're about to do a, a whole virtual version of this with Limpopo Tourism. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. And I know Mendes has been having discussions. Well, I mean, you know, and, and I've been in meetings with um, the Eastern Cape Tourism guys. So I think, you know, while, we, while we're looking at uh, a period in which we hoping to open up a lot sooner there seems to be an appetite that we should be looking at some of these sort of virtual platforms where we can expose our dmcs as as key funnels um in in the chain to some of the new and and interesting product that sort of sits out there so i just think from you know from a satsa point of view that's that's one of the practical uh things we put forward so i think graham we need to just sort of ramp that uh that discussion up and try and get that into a practical into a practical offering we can take forward because you know, obviously that it's, it's contingent on sort of technology variables and every and 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 the like but we've done some good work as the sets of board marketing committee we've got some interesting uh, um, solutions there so I think watch the space practically in the next two or three weeks let's move forward with that thanks David um, Donay has asked a question I'm going to ask Craig to unmute himself I saw you had a little visitor a little bit earlier Craig I don't know who was opening your door to say hello but thank goodness you stopped them in their tracks so the question no. is what no, they were actually crawling on the floor behind me and opened it because I told them they couldn't walk behind me <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing that BBC interview flash across my mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so what opportunities or suggestions? So the question was around tourist guides and even tour operators during the domestic travel period before inbound restrictions are lifted. We did speak a little bit earlier about domestic tra travel not being the silver bullet, but I'm acutely aware that as tour operators and tourist guides, the domestic tourism sector is not that appealing for us because they don't use us to travel. So what opportunities would you say, um, as a DMC, you feel that tourist guides and DMCs would have in facilitating domestic travel? How could you insert yourself into it? That, that's a great, was that from Danae? That's a great, that's a great point. In fact, one of the points that I, I did want to raise is um, I feel like um, in the whole scenario, we've spoken a lot about communities, which is, which is super important, but one of the groups that has fallen through the net in terms of support has been our freelance guiding um, pool in South Africa. Um, you know, they, a lot of them are not under full-time employment. Uh, they can't, they're not eligible for, te for TERS or for UIF, and because of that, their work has gone from monthly guiding fees to absolutely zero with nothing, um, with nothing on the horizon. And if you look at us, we probably work with, if you take our day touring into account as well, we probably work with on and off 80, 80 different freelance guides that, that have now fallen out of the support net and have absolutely no access to financial funds whatsoever. I think one of the, the, the issues really with, and it is something we're trying to address um, internally as well, one of the issues with guides and the domestic market is guiding is very often associated with private touring, um, and private touring for the domestic market is an expensive um, is, is an expensive option. Um, 
Um, uh, scheduled touring is obviously much more affordable, but unless you have the numbers, which we don't currently have, scheduled touring isn't an option. Um, so what we're trying to do and trying to work on now, um, it's, it's just still in planning phase, is a series of private guided um, South African domestic tourism um, a day to options that we can do um, with more of a domestic interest. So, and certainly in the Western Cape, we've already seen a little bit of pickup on, um, on domestic tourism and the guiding, doing South Africans wanting to get out and do the winelands. Um, if you throw some alcohol in it, South Africans normally want to do some, some kind of touring. Um, and we're having to do that at a super reduced rate, but it's fine because vehicles are standing empty. We can put those vehicles on at a cost. Um, the guides might have to take a reduction in their daily guiding fee, but um, you know, half a loaf is better than no loaf. Um, and that's a really, really good point. Uh, I think the question is how do we come in at a price point that is going to be appealing to South Africa to the domestic market? And how do we then market that to South Africans? Because it's not a product that they're familiar with or that they've ever used um, in the past. But it can, it can easily be done. And the, the, the small numbers that we have done in the past have been a huge success. So really something to work on, I agree. Wonderful. Thank you, Craig. That's very uplifting. I'm happy to hear that. And I'm sure Donne is as well. And many of our tourist guides are on the call as well. Okay, David, we are on the five o'clock mark. I am going to hand over to you um, so that you can say farewell. And then we will shoot off to our coffee chats afterwards. If you haven't registered, please do. Natalia, thank you. And guys, thank you for your, for your time and your insights and your wisdom this afternoon. Um, as I said in the course of the discussion, there's no, there are no easy answers here. You know, a lot of people, there's a lot of emotion out there. A lot of people um, feel, you know, they're feeling the pain. Um, what we're trying to do in this, in this process is sort of move towards a common view about what the future of our, our, our sector needs to look like. I think we, you know, we, we, we certainly need to emerge through, you know, through this, through the storm. And, you know, I think there've been some great points um, raised. Thank you for bringing in. I mean, you know, bringing us back to the whole issue around communities and 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 how important they are in terms of our USB going forward. So we'll be collating this. This is all going to be part of um, a, a refined thing. And guys, we're not trying to produce a tome here. We're trying to get a two to three pager that speaks to the five or six key issues we need to take forward and get government to listen to. And I think your voices in this in this respect have been invaluable. There's been some 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 really good. Uh, really good thought leadership um, today. So I want to thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who's made comments. Um, I haven't seen everybody involved, but there's, there's, I mean, there's been a, there's been great attendance. And thanks to the guys um, who are, are, are colleagues from, from shores afar from, I see a lot of people from the UK have, 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 have locked into this one. So thanks for your um, opinions. And as Natalia said, if you have that epiphany moment, I mean, you know, we've all got ideas. Send us the two pager to communications at satsa.co.za. It will be fed, fed through into the, in, um, into the process. So thanks again, guys. I look forward to seeing you. I'll probably have a beer in my hand when I next see you. And uh, uh, let's get into the chat rooms. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Thank you, David. My thanks to the panelists and everyone who attended today. Look out for the recording and we'll catch you on the flip side. Stay safe, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>